Hello again and welcome to the thermodynamics module and we're looking at lecture number 11. Uh, we're going to be looking again at heat engines um, and I've just wrote a few things up that we discussed in our last lecture um, and, you, and all this is leading to, uh, to leading to entropy which is where we want to get to uh, and a slightly different form of the second law. But last time we looked at this idea of reversibility um, and essentially reverse, reversible processes uh, are essentially fictitious processes. All processes have friction in them, all processes have gradients in them. So essentially in practice they don't exist. Uh, we identified uh, a reversible process to be one, well it was essentially quasi-static, to be, there had to be equilibrium uh, involved in in, a, in a, a reversible process, uh, just so that you can tip the balance uh, and get it to move in the opposite direction by what we call an infinitesimal change, a, a very tiny change um, to that balance, uh, uh, reverse the process. Uh, so in, in, in practical terms, it makes these processes very, very slow, very slow indeed. We cannot do things very rapidly. Uh, because we get finite differences occurring uh, in temperatures, in pressures, and so forth. Um, and that would make it irreversible. Uh, we also could see that we could identify uh, irreversible processes rather quickly. Anything with friction in it was irreversible, and anything with a gradient uh, in it was um, also irreversible. So a temperature gradient uh, where heat was transferred across that gradient. However, we, we go to get we well we also looked at uh, re reversibility applied to heat engines. So this is where which is of interest uh, for us uh, because it's going to lead to it is going to lead to entropy. Uh, we had two statements for the second law of thermodynamics. So these are uh, arising out of experimental observation, and this is the thing about. Sort of classical thermodynamics, it is based on this, you know, thousands if not millions of experiments that have taken place all conform uh, to these laws. So the chances of uh, the, them being wrong are uh, pretty slender. Uh, so we have the Kel Kelvin-Planck Kelvin statement, uh, which essentially says, look, if I've got something uh, going through a cycle of a machine, a device, an engine, if you like, operating on a cycle, uh, then um, you can't have this. You can't just get work out of that. You can't take heat from a single reservoir and produce work. This is uh, something you can't have. Uh, so um, this is an essentially true. And as we mentioned last time, um, energy, uh, first law has been satisfied here, Q1 is equal to WS, so when you're going on a cycle here, the material that's going on a cycle, um, uh, it doesn't accumulate energy, uh, its properties don't change of course. Well, the, the, in, in totality, uh, you can think of a, a, pe a, pa uh, uh, a piece of mass going round, and obviously that individual mass will change uh, as it goes round uh, an engine. But if you looked at a sort of spatial configuration of the whole thing, it would look like nothing has changed. Uh, um, there's different temperatures okay at different points, but those, those spatial points, the temperatures would remain the same in the fluid. So overall, the, the, the process is static. It doesn't look like that there's anything changing in that sense. Anyways, we, this is ruled out. We cannot do this. We just, uh, energy, heat energy cannot produce work um, without rejecting heat, really, this is what it's saying to us. Uh, that was the Kelvin Planck. We also looked at Clausius' statement. Uh, so this is our engine, and this is this is, looks like our uh, reversed uh, heat engine. Uh, and in that case, uh, it, um, the statement said that uh, what we couldn't do, uh, operate again around a cycle, and um, we couldn't drag energy out of a cold reservoir uh, and supply it to a hot reservoir uh, uh, without really doing work. I mean, that's that's the uh, so this is this is essentially outlawed. If you want to do this, 
and we've looked at our refrigerators and uh, heat pumps, uh, we need to provide work. Uh, so these, the, so essentially the laws are ruling out certain things that though they satisfy the first law, um, they do not satisfy, well, this is the second law, they do not satisfy the second law of these. Uh, uh, these statements are essentially equivalent, really. Uh, so what we can do, of course, we have, uh, this is what we can do. We can have an engine where uh, we've got some substance going around a cycle, uh, some fluid, thermodynamic fluid. Uh, heat has been drawn from a hot reservoir. Remember when we looked at this, this was uh, essentially this was provided by combustion. This was how we were supplying that uh, out of a gas. So it was being burnt uh, and uh, at high temperature was being produced. And that high temperature was allowing um, energy to, uh, to flow uh, to a cooler temperature generally. Uh, in the in the, um, in the in the form of fluid that's going around the cycle. Uh, later on, we draw. We had to re, we had a condenser, you may recall, and we would draw and eat out with some cooling fluid usually, uh, and rejecting that then to uh, another reservoir. So that's a that's a heat engine. Uh, this this is allowed. That was not allowed. This is allowed, uh, and this was either a, a refrigerator or a heat pump. Uh, essentially, we have a, 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 a fluid going around this thing. We're having to put work into it to, to do this. Uh, and with work, we can draw, we can draw um, energy from a cold uh, reservoir. So the magic of refrigeration, uh, we're able to uh, draw energy out from a cold and reject it into a hot. Um, but we have to do to create this magic, we have to do work uh, and design things, of course, to enable to do that and uh, utilize the material properties of refrigerants. Uh, some of the refrigerant properties are in the tables. Um, um, so, and uh, there were these questions in the tutorials on the assignments as well. Uh, I think that's a question on refrigeration. Uh, you might be using uh, some of those properties. We found that uh, we want to analyze these type of things, of course, and we want to define the efficiency of these things. We're interested as engineers of building efficient machines. Uh, and we, these were our definitions of efficiency. Um, so we had the thermal efficiency. This was applied to our heat engine, the direct engine. Uh, and what we wanted out of this thing was the work. What was being supplied was the, what was, was the Q. So what we wanted out was WS and what we supplied was Q1. So that was the, that was the thermal efficiency. Uh, we had a slightly different definition uh, for the refrigerator, beta coefficient of performance, we call that, COP. Um, and what you, want out, what you want from a refrigerator, of course, is Q2. You want to draw energy out of the cold reservoir. Um, and to do that, we had to supply work to do it. So what we wanted was Q2. What we had to do was supply WS. And that was that. Um, and then for the uh, the heat pump, now the heat pump, uh, what we want for the heat pump is supply energy, usually to the high temperature, uh, higher temperature. And we draw we draw energy from the cold. But what we're in, what we're essentially after. It's heating up a room, heating up a building, uh, a warehouse, a market, I don't know, wherever you want to heat up, uh, heat pumps, uh, chemical engineering building, we have heat pumps for that uh, in, in the university. Um, and what, we, what we're trying to do then is uh, to apply energy uh, to maintain the temperature, uh, keep the place warm, yes. Uh, so what we want for that is B dash, we call that, coefficient of performance again. Uh, Q1 over WS, that's meant to be. So WS, uh, shaft work, yeah. So, so I think that's where we got to last time. Well, we also mentioned uh, reversible uh, uh, reversible engines. Uh, and what I'm going to do then is specify the Carnot principles. Which basically state, uh, well, that's more than one of them. 
For the Cardinal principles, uh, Cardinal, uh, again, an individual ahead of his time, uh, took many years before people realised um, uh, his ideas, understood his ideas. Um, um, and uh, yes, he uh, died, he died very young, uh, Cardinal. Um, brilliant, brilliant mind, that's for sure. Um, so, Carno principle, what did Carno say? Well, he said that uh, if you have uh, two engines uh, operating between uh, the same reservoir, the reversible engine is, uh, is, um, is more efficient, really. It's the most efficient, in fact, I suppose. Uh, so the, the efficiency, so one of the, the efficiency of an irreversible, oops, yeah, no, irreversible engine, heat engine, let's bring it like that, heat engine is always less, less than irreversible heat engine. So Carla said that uh, you've got this situation and you have a reversible uh, uh, heat engine. Thus, we mentioned, we talked about what we have to achieve with reversible, but essentially what we can do is reverse it. We can change the direction of this work and everything just reverses, the temperatures and everything, the heat flux and all, all the rest of it are the same. It just runs in the opposite direction. Uh, this is a reversed, uh, which is slightly different uh, heat engine. This is a reversible one. It's one that you can run in two directions um, uh, and generally doesn't exist, of course. So this is a, a conceptual idea. But he argued that the efficiency then, so the thermal efficiency, uh, thermal efficiency of a irreversible, let's say put it like that, is always less or equal to the thermal efficiency of a reversible. This is what he was at, R for reversible. Then. So this is the statement he made. Uh, so one of his one of his principles. Uh, it's a corollary of the of the of the um, of the uh, second law of thermodynamics. Um, so one of the corollaries. Um, uh, it also said that uh, that uh, any two reversible uh, any two reversible engines operating between the same temperatures uh, has the same efficiency. Uh, so the efficiency or any, any uh, the efficiencies. Of uh, uh, reversible heat engines operating between the same reservoirs, reservoirs. Is the same identical? So we've got the same efficiencies. Mathematically speaking, then, uh, if you've got two reversible, uh, put it like this: the thermal efficiency of uh, uh, one engine, let's call it uh, um, uh, R1, is equal to the thermal efficiency uh, of another engine, call it R2. Yeah, something like that. So we've got two two reversible engines operating between the same reservoirs. Then you'll find that the thermal efficiency uh, is the same. Uh, now I'm not going to prove this here. It's, you can prove it. It's uh, um, you, you can do it by proof of contradiction, um, and the proof is in the notes. It's in the appendix, appendix one of uh, chapter seven. Uh, I'll, I'll let you have a look at that. You can read that. It's just out of interest. I mean, once. You, once you've seen it, and fair enough, you just forget about it almost immediately. It's uh, you know it's not of practical value. 
Uh, I'm going to come back and show this, in fact, a bit later on. When, once I've got entropy, I'll come back and, uh, and show why this is the case. Or why is it the case that these engines uh, are, are more efficient? Why is a reversible engine the most efficient engine you can do? Uh, but, and, uh, uh, and, and also, uh, why do you get the same efficiency? So I will come back to this. I'm going to ask you to accept, accept it for the moment. Uh, but it does have implications. It does have implications. This particular statement, for instance, you've got two engines which are reversible, um, and they could be operating on different uh, substances, different thermofluids. And it's kind of telling you that, therefore, the uh, efficiency, the thermal efficiency of a reversible engine cannot depend on the fluid, uh, so the substance that you've got, or the designs that you put into the the heat engine. Uh, so the only thing it can depend upon, therefore, is the actual reservoir temperatures. Uh, so that's the conclusion you would draw uh, that the thermal efficiency of a reversible engine must be only dependent uh, on the on the temperatures uh, because you can change everything else. If you've got the same temperatures, that's what you're saying, operating between the same reservoirs. And you could change the thermal fluid in your designs and all the rest of it, run it very slowly, or by some magic you can get a reversible process. Um, you will find that the thermal efficiencies are the same. It cannot therefore depend on the uh, on the, uh, the thermal fluids that are involved on the machinery or anything like that. So what he's basically saying is that this principle here uh, is saying that the thermal efficiency of a reversible engine, therefore, is only dependent on the temperature, on the tube temperatures, in fact, the, the reservoir temperatures, that's what the argument is. So, well, so I can deduce uh, from this thing that the thermal efficiency, thermal efficiency of a reversible engine uh, is a function of uh, T1 and T2, say, for our engine. So we've got our engine, T1, um, and it's reversible. I usually put a little R on this thing when, it's, when you've got a reversible one. One that you can switch in both directions. So WS, Q1, uh, Q, well, sorry, Q2. Uh, well, sometimes you put an R on this, you know, this is a... Q1, this is the reversible situation um, where you've got your work. Uh, so you've got heat transfer. In this situation, uh, the, the thermal efficiency is only dependent upon uh, uh, on the on the temperature. And bear in mind, we already have thermal efficiency. Our thermal efficiency, of course, was equal to uh, well, what we want out of the thing and uh, 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 what you supply, Jess. So our thermal efficiency uh, for this thing, what we want out of it, of course, was work. Uh, what we had to supply was uh, Q1, of course. So this was our thermal efficiency. Uh, um, we also, of course, uh, first of all, has to be satisfied. We know that Q1... Q1 is equal to Ws plus Q2. This energy is going in there. It's coming out there. Uh, the energy of the of the engine is not changing, of course, That's, uh, because it's in a cycle. It must be true. So what I can do then, I could... Uh, uh, Ws then is equal to Q1 minus Q2 over Q1, and I could write that then as uh, 1 minus Q2 over Q1. So that was the thermal efficiency. And what for a reversible situation, this could only depend on uh, well on the on the on the two temperatures. That's what this this, this conclusion drawn from Carnot's principle. Uh, uh, this conclusion. Now it was there was another uh, corollary corollary, uh, the third one, which by Kelvin who, who basically went a little step further and, and used this idea to define uh, uh, a temperature scale. Um, and what he said was, 
this 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 ratio here, Q1, Q2 over Q1. Uh, uh, ah, let's put an R on that. Um, in the reversible situation, uh, it's a function of temp, a function of uh, a function of temp T1 and, and T2, but he argued that actually it had to be uh, a ratio. Um, uh, and it, well, you can write like this phi of T2 over phi of T1, where phi is an arbitrary function, uh, but a mono monotonically increasing function, uh, essentially. And in fact, he set this to be. Uh, he set phi t, phi t well. He set phi t to be t. Uh, so he's, this was defined to be t one t two over t one uh, was was what uh, Kelvin did in his uh, in his Crowley. Again, I put this in the appendix. Uh, it's very see. It's very easy to prove this that it has to be like this when you look at a chain. You can look at the chain of of uh, reversible engines, uh, and it, it forces. Uh, this this the, this thing, which is a function of t1 and t2, but actually the function has to be a ratio of this type, um, and it's it's fairly easy to see. I'll, I'll let you look at that for your own reading. Uh, we're going to take this as, uh, and from this you could define the Kelvin scale. This is well, this is the Kel this is um, define the Kelvin scale here. But of course, the scale wasn't set by this; it's set by it's set by identifying uh, well, the triple point, uh, 273.16. Um, uh, um, uh, yes, uh, of, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, triple point temperature. Um, so the, the triple point temperature is identified. Uh, let me just check that actually. Uh, Yeah, so yes, right, 273.16 for the triple point, and also the interval for the Kelvin was specified to be that of uh, that for the uh, Celsius, so their, their, their match essentially, and that fixed the scale. But the thing about it, the important fundamental point is that, um, uh, that um, this temperature scale is not dependent uh, on any material because uh, it's dependent only on reversibility. It's, so it's a conceptual thing. It's, uh, we can change the materials, it doesn't make any difference as far as this is concerned. So there's no material, thermometric uh, material involved in its specification. Um, so that's, that was that. So what we find then, that the thermal efficiency, then, the thermal efficiency for a reversible uh, is equal to one minus uh, T2 over T1. So this is a the thermal efficiency for a reversible engine was given by this result, um, which was quite a it was quite a powerful result. Uh, so when so when is the um, so what is required for this? I mean, we could ask ourselves what's the uh, what's the best thing you could do? One is the uh, the upper limit, isn't it? Uh, we can never reach the one, uh, uh, but that would be ruled out by the second law, of course. Uh, one could be achieved by, uh, you could argue, by setting T2 to zero, absolute zero, yes. Uh, in, Col in Kelvin's paper, he, he talks about the fact that we have this lower bound. Uh, it's set by, uh, the well, the kelvin Planck version of the thing. We can see we can't have this thing uh, missing. Uh, which essentially what would happen if, uh, um, uh, yeah, if you were, if you were um, uh, setting setting t two t two to zero, we can't we can't set t two to zero uh, uh, in that case. Um, uh, so t two was zero, then q two would be zero. Yes, this is the this is what we'd be arguing there. And that would invalidate the second law of thermodynamics. Um, so we can't, we can't, we can't do that. Um, what, 
so one thing you can do to make it a good a good efficient machine is have T1 very high. Uh, so that's that's one thing you could do. We drive this drive this uh, to be very small. Yes, this is what you're trying to do. Um, uh, so significantly less than one, I suppose. What you want really uh, require uh, T2 over T1 to be certainly less than one, yes, you want it to be a small number, uh, but we have to have it greater than zero, uh, basically. Uh, that's certainly what we want. Um, it's less than one, obviously T1 is greater than T2, we certainly want that. T1 is the high temperature, so that is less than one by, by design, I suppose. Uh, but we want, uh, yeah, and we can't, we can't set it to, uh, to zero because that it violates the second law, uh, and in fact, there's a third law which stops you getting to zero with these with heat engines uh, or refrigeration processes. Um, so there's a barrier there, anyways. Um, uh, but there is a limit, of course, how big you can make T1, and from practical purposes, uh, just the the melting temperatures of of um, of, of the containment. Uh, the equipment that you use in any design, yes. So there's certain limitations on um, uh, on what you can do with this ratio, uh, and consequently, you find that uh, you know uh, from th the thermal efficiency of, of even the best machines uh, is, uh, is is limited. This 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 is limiting. You don't get 100% efficient. You can't, we nowhere near get 100% efficient. Uh, you're very limited by, this is the thermodynamic limit on the efficiency. Uh, you cannot beat the reversible. Uh, there's something about reversible that makes it so you can't beat it. Uh, we'll get back to it and I will show you that what, what it is, is that entropy um, is not being produced um, when you've got uh, reversible machines. So this is the this is the this is the situation as far as um, as far as uh, a reversible heat engine is concerned. You find that the uh, quite a fundamental thing. This is what uh, quite a fundamental thing um, that uh, it only depends on it only depends on the efficiency of it. Doesn't matter how clever you are if your condensers, boilers, and all the bits of equipment you care to put in there. Well, there's lots of different modifications, lots of different designs that you could try. It makes uh, no, no difference. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's limited by this. You cannot beat this. So anything you do will always be less than this. Uh, that's for sure. And yeah, of course, um, you know, this is the max. This is the maximum you can do. And quite often you don't get anywhere near it. <laughs> uh, because, of course, all machines are essentially uh, reversible. Uh, so that that is uh, so that is uh, uh, a telling point. Uh, uh, so this is an interesting limitation on uh, on your on your designs. Uh, well, that's that's for a heat engine. Let's have a look at the uh, the reversed heat engine. So that's for direct heat engine. Um, so let's have a look at that. <coughs> It's a nice simple formula of it. It's a nice simple formula. We, uh, uh, but let's have a look at how. Uh, so let's have a look at the situation of uh, T one, and let's have a look at a, a, a reverse, a reversible, uh, usually written like that with a little R on it. Um, not that way, yes, Doesn't matter really. So that's T two, uh, Q two. Q1, and of course we're going to have to do some work on this thing. So we're going to have to do some work. Um, so what is the coefficient of performance for this thing? It's a reversible uh, heat pump or reversible uh, refrigerator. Um, so we want a, a similar formula, don't we? So what do we know? Let's have a, let's have a look at the refrigerator first. Beta. Uh, what we want out of uh, a, re a refrigerator is Q2. Uh, and what we've got to put in, of course, we've got to do work uh, in that case. 
what we can see, however, is that Q1 is equal to WS plus Q2. That's what we can see from the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, this is coming in. That's going in. It's coming out of there. There's nothing being stored in the engine itself. Um, so what we can get rid of, I suppose, is the is the WS. Uh, so let's write this here again. So beta in this case is equal to Q2 over Q1 minus Q2, yes? Uh, we know that uh, we have this ratio Q2 over Q1. Um, and we can once we've got that ratio, we can substitute in T2 over T1. So that's what we can that's what we can do. Uh, well, essentially, you can replace the Qs by, by Ts, to be honest. Um, because if I divide through by, uh, by Q1, I can divide the top and bottom all by Q1, and then I'd get uh, the ratio uh, T2 over T1. Then I can multiply back out by T1. So <laughs> I can see uh, that this thing is T2 over T1 minus t2 yes so that's very reversible i've put a little r on that then so the reversible uh refrigerator is given by uh, is given by this particular this particular number um yeah in that case um so and we can also do the same for a heat pump yes we can do the same for the heat pump so for a heat pump we've got um what do we want for the heat pump? Beta dashed uh, for the heat pump. Um, heat pump, what we want is the Q1. Uh, what we're having to put in is WS. Uh, exactly the same. That, that still applies. My first law of thermodynamics works. It doesn't change for the heat pump. So that's equal to uh, Q1 uh, over uh, Q1 minus Q2. And again, for the reversible, so I'll put an R on this, uh, we're going to find that that's equal to T1 over T1 minus T2. So that's the, uh, so that's the, so these are the formulas for reversible efficiencies, coefficient of performances uh, for the refrigerator and the heat pump essentially and these are thermo this is the thermodynamic scale of course we, we have to, everything's thermodynamic a big t there uh, in this in this uh, in this process really um so there that's the uh, that's the situation uh with them uh, so interesting it's quite interesting that the efficiencies of these type of engines is only been is only dependent on the um, the uh, is only dependent on the uh, the actual temperatures uh, of the of the reservoirs, irrespective of the of the machinery that that we use. Um, and and it's, I guess it's it is conceptual. This is the reason why it is because reversibility is sort of like it's a conceptual thing. Uh, we know we can't achieve it in practice, um, but it happens to be the most efficient kinds of machines. Uh, as far as uh, uh, heat engines and direct and reversed are uh, concerned, um, and so that this was uh, so this is quite quite an important uh, piece of information. Well, all this is uh, okay. All this is is going to lead us to um, it's going to lead us lead us to entropy. Uh, and that is essentially the next lecture I'm going to be looking at that. Um, uh, I suppose, yes, I could, I could just before I do that, uh, I could again look at the, uh, the microscopic view of entropy um, um, before we get on to that. Um, so, Yes, yes. Okay, we'll do that. Let's do that. I think, um, I mean, I can put some numbers in these just to show you how bad it really is in, in design, I suppose, um, um, in, in the reality of things. But uh, I think you can stick numbers in. I think in the notes, there's some num I put some numbers in these, show you the, uh, just how inefficient 
Um, we have to re reject a lot of energy generally. Uh, uh, 40% is not unheard of uh, in terms of heat. Uh, it, it, it does appear that using heat to, produce, to do work is in many ways um, uh, quite an inefficient process. Um, uh, sometimes, of course, this heat is used for alternative heat and homes and things like that. So if you design your power plants, uh, but of course, if uh, you're producing electricity or something, you get lots of heat rejected. Uh, if you could use that for other processes, then fine. You know, you, uh, uh, yeah, it's all good. Uh, but there is a lot of energy wasted, and usually it was uh, big cooling towers of the, of the past. Because how we got rid of that, just belching it back into the atmosphere. Um, but uh, you can improve, I suppose, uh, yeah, combined heat and power uh, systems, uh, which uh, which uh, you know make use of the fact that you are you want to waste all this heat, that you want to reject it, you won't work. Somehow works more efficient, more more superior in a way. Yes, uh, it's it's more difficult to uh, to get work. You have to design things. That's what I mentioned at the start. It's easy to heat, just burn things. Yes. Um, so uh, so work to get work. Work is sought after. So something's work is, is it's a form of energy that um, somehow, in some sense, superior than than heat, uh, and uh, and therefore. You can't convert. You can't convert heat to work uh, without rejecting heat. Uh, it's not possible. But you can do the other way. You can uh, you can convert work to heat uh, fully. Uh, friction process is one of them. You know, if you're just rubbing a, a duster on the board or something and doing work, and it's in the end, it's uh, it's all turned to heat um, and then temperature rising as a consequence. So. Um, somehow work is yeah somehow work is uh, more superior. Okay, what I want to do this is going to lead us to well this is interesting in its own right. This is the thing uh, um, heat engines are quite interesting in their own right. Uh, but what I want to do is um, is uh, start thinking about entropy because this is actually going to lead us uh, to entropy, uh, though a slightly indirect route I would say than. Then, uh, if you looked at the microstructural uh, route, I'm going to have a quick look at the microstructural route just to set me up for the next lecture, if you don't mind. So I've kind of finished this. This is each engine sort of done. Um, the key key formulas have been given: uh, efficiency, uh, reversible engines, and reversible engines, reversible and more efficient, um, but produce no power. <laughs> in a sense, the, uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, okay, the, it's one of the reasons why we're looking at uh, energy transfers rather than uh, uh, rather than power transfers is that uh, um, you have to run these uh, reversible engines extraordinarily slowly. Uh, to, for them ever to be reversible, uh, as we saw by our definition, that this, everything has to be in equilibrium. Uh, if things are running very slowly, then they're not producing a great deal of power. Yes. Uh, so uh, lots of lots of uh, energy, but little power uh, uh, practically. But uh, that's the, that's the situation with that. Okay, let's have a, um, so the next topic is entropy, 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 so this is the, uh, the last chapter of the, of our, of the, of the book, of our and book, um, and all I want to do then, just to look at the microscopic, before, uh, the, the theory that I've mentioned, I'll recap it a little bit more later, uh, again, uh, and, uh, and we look to see how it can uh, get us to entropy. Uh, but there is this microscopic view, uh, 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 this absolute entropy, which I've already mentioned, yes, absolute entropy. That is S is equal to K in that log of W. K was Boltzmann constant, W is the weight of an arrangement, the way you can 
uh, fill up the energy levels in the sense um, uh, where um, uh, where mo uh, molecules, the energy, the energy levels of the molecules can be arranged. A number of possible ways to achieve the same energy, essentially. Uh, all I want to do, I want to just do a, a sort of uh, uh, a fairly quick demonstration of uh, how this works. But just to fix in your mind, actually, what is entropy? What is it doing? Because it's, uh, the reversibility route is slightly obscure. It doesn't really tell you. Um, very much like when we worked out energy and temperature using the sort of macroscopic view of things, using equilibrium, using the cycle. Uh, we are going to use a cycle again, as it turns out, um, when we look at entropy. Uh, okay, it's fine. It uh, gets to it, makes the units subject totally self-contained, uh, very beautifully knitted together, uh, but also a little obscure uh, what the things are. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to consider a situation um, of, uh, of a system of uh, gas or fluid, whatever, and I'm going to bring into it, uh, I'm going to have uh, two reservoirs. Uh, let's imagine. I'm going to insulate this. Let's insulate it. I'm going to have my system. Let's put my system in here of uh, fluid. And I'm going to bring a, a reservoir. Um, uh, uh, let's put this as my reservoir. T1, and I'm going to bring another reservoir here in contact of T2. And we're going to have T2 greater than T1. Let's, let's assume that. Uh, and this is my, uh, my fluid, my system anyway, we'll just call it a system. Um, and if I, well, let's move, let's move uh, this equation up the road for a second. Uh, that's our absolute entropy, S is equal to K, natural log of W. And if I look at the temperatures, we've got it, if I plotted the temperatures, let's assume then that um, I'm plotting the temperatures uh, along the thing. And we've got our T1 here and up to, we've got a linear, it doesn't have to be linear, but let's make it linear. Uh, at the, temp the temperature, um, uh, yeah, along the along the. Uh, so the temperature is linear, basically. Uh, as we move along this system, uh, we've got the temperature increasing uh, because this is in contact with this reservoir. This is in contact with that. So this wall here is at T1 and this wall is at T2 and there's a, there's a temperature difference you know, with this. Uh, and the temperature, it's got a gradient. Uh, this is the thing, it's, it's got a gradient in there. I'm just trying to set up a gradient. Well, the next thing I do, I'm going to take these, magically take these reservoirs away instantaneously and bring the system and move. And the next instant, look at our system. And I'm going to isolate it. Well, let's do that. Let's isolate the system. Uh, so this is uh, our system. Again. Uh, and the question then is, what happens? So instantaneously, I've got rid of these reservoirs. I've, ins I've insulated, it's totally isolated, there's no energy transfer, there's no any this is all insulation, by the way, there's no energy transfers to the surroundings, no mass transfers, it's totally isolated. Uh, what happens? Well, what happens is uh, it changes, it doesn't stay put, it doesn't stay put at that gradient. What happens is that the system, uh, the temperature equalizes after a bit, with any, after a little a bit of time, probably not too long, we end up with this temperature. That's our that's our temperature of that layer, and then let's plot the plot it again. Temperature uh, along this way, and we're going to find it's a constant. That's some in between. In fact, they'll end up in between the two, as it turns out. Uh, we're not worried too much about exactly where, but let's see. One, it's going to end up in the middle of the two. 
uh, it'll end up being a constant. Uh, now, I would suggest to you that the entropy uh, for this system is higher than the entropy for this system. Um, but this is the reason for this. Well, you can do it by this formula. You can show it by this formula. Um, because uh, when you think about the molecules in this system here, yes, uh, what we have with the molecules is high energy molecules at this right hand side and low energy molecules at this side. It's low temperature after all and a gradient in between. If you look at this system, uh, all the molecules have got the same, the same uh, energy, if you like. So what I cannot do, uh, if I want to, when I look at this W, what it's about is about being able to rearrange uh, the molecules, uh, for, to swap them, if you like. Uh, what I can't do, I have to have, all the molecules with high energy have to stay here. They cannot go, cannot be placed over there because it alters the temperature, yes? So it's not possible to rearrange the molecules. Here, I can take any molecule and swap it and it will not change the energy of the system, okay? So what I, what I find is, so this is state one, and this is state two, you know, what we're gonna find is that W2 is significantly, well, generally greater than W1, yes? So the, the way I can, the molecules can be arranged, the, this, this W, this way of arrangement is the way you can arrange things, how many possible ways you can arrange things uh, to ensure the same uh, the, uh, the same energy, same total energy. In fact, the energies have not changed. This system, when I as soon as I isolated it, it's the end, there's no energy loss. It's got the same energy. Um, and what's happened to the the what in fact happens? Nature's proclivity to kill off gradients. This is what it tries to do. And you could you could you could explain it just mechanically. Mechanically, what's happening is that these molecules. High energy are interacting with the lower energy ones. Uh, okay, this is this is uh, maintaining the, the status quo. Uh, once you've took these reservoirs away, then what happens is they all mix up and they end up with approximately the same energy. Uh, and W2 is, and that is entropy in play. Uh, what it's telling me is that S2 is greater than S1. In fact, uh, S2 reaches a maximum, it's a maximum, that this is the maximum, uh, it tends to a maximum does entropy. Uh, and this is a natural process, it's a spontaneous process, no work involved. Uh, and all that's going on then, uh, when you think about entropy, is that all that's happening is mixing. It's mixing things, you're trying to adopt the, the, the most likely uh, state uh, of the system, uh, and the one that uh, as the maximum arrangement of things is the most likely. Uh, and so this is a microscopic view. It's a very simple view, it's not difficult. Uh, entropy changes as a consequence of, uh, of mixing uh, and reaches a maximum at equilibrium. This is thermal equilibrium. We've got thermal equilibrium here um, in this situation and entropy has reached the maximum. So this is the microscopic view of entropy. Um, and we don't need it, admittedly, when we do our thermodynamics. Um, we don't need it at all. It's like that time now. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's just to give you a, a view of it. So every time you see a gradient, what nature is trying to do is uh, kill off the gradient. Uh, and there's no interaction here. So notice entropy has not been conserved. There's no inter uh, even I isolated the system. Yet entropy increased. Uh, that wouldn't be the came for energy. The energy, uh, once I once I immediately isolated the system, the energy that was there stayed, despite the fact changes were taking place. So the total energy did not change. As soon as I isolated the system, the energy was fixed. As uh, so the energy was fixed, but the entropy was not. The entropy uh, reached a maximum at this at the at equilibrium, um, and one manifestation of the second law, quite a powerful manifestation, says that the entropy uh, of an isolated system uh, will increase, essentially, will always go up in, for any spontaneous change. Uh, uh, in the limit, it could stay the same, but generally it goes up. 
Uh, if you've got a change going on, entropy will always increase. Anyways, we're going to define entropy in a slightly different way. We're going to get to it by reversibility next time. Uh, but this is this view of it, this microscopic view, is quite an easy view. It's uh, it's not a complicated way of thinking about it, but essentially it's just a mixing process uh, uh, with the, all the molecules essentially adopting uh, similar energy levels uh, in this case. Okay, I'll leave it and we'll, we'll continue this con conversation next time. Uh, I'll say goodbye. Bye-bye.